Hey everyone, welcome back to Cyber Gray Matter. In today's video, we're going to be going over a topic and strategy in cybersecurity called Defense in Depth. In short, Defense in Depth as it pertains to cybersecurity is an approach that involves the layering of security as a defense. And it's very important to the organization's security posture. Let's get started. Defense in Depth, or sometimes known as Security in Depth, is a comprehensive and strategical approach to security coming from the NSA, or the National Security Agency. It was inspired by the military strategy, but they both do differ. The military version focuses heavily on creating space around the perimeter of the defense, and this is done to create more time to act. However, in the cybersecurity world, there isn't space in the same way. Though not completely the same, the main similarity between the military and cyber concepts can be explained in an analogy with a medieval castle. A castle will have various security defenses, including a water moat, both outside and inner walls, limited entry points, watchtowers, and more, all of which are layers of security. This creates redundancy, making it so if one fails, there will be something else in the way. Just like castles, we have different types of controls to help defend, detect, and deter. The three most prominent controls in a defense in depth are physical, technical, and administrative. Physical controls are security preventative measures. These can be things such as putting locks on doors, putting up fences, or having cameras. Technical controls can be both hardware and software based and protect a company's data held on various assets. These could be things like intrusion detection or prevention systems, web application firewalls, configuration management, web scanners, two-factor authentication, biometrics, web scanners, password managers, virtual private networks, encryption, and backups. Administrative controls consist of policies and procedures that are set for both employees and vendors. This could be general policies relating to the information security and other specific policies, such as vendor management and information risk strategies. Let's get into the security layers and where they fall within the network, along with some examples to help you conceptualize each one. There are five here, and we're going to start with Perimeter. Perimeter, also known as edge security, is the first layer of our defense and separates the untrusted part of the environment to the trusted network. This could start with having cameras in the server room and locks in the doors to the building. This also includes things like firewalls, which can filter and log traffic and operate in the network in the transport layer of the OSI model. The DMZ, also known as the demilitarized zone, is also in our perimeter and is the safe zone between the internal network and the internet and contains external facing servers, such as a mail and a web server. The IPS, or Intrusion Protection System, and IDS, Intrusion Detection System, will also be here. The difference between the two is that IPS will take action to stop something and the IDS will log it. They are based upon both signature and anomaly also known as behavior-based methodologies. Also found in the DMZ is the VPN. In the network layer, there's VoIP protection, which is done through encryption and multi-factor authentication. Web proxies are beneficial here because you can force policy onto user end devices and centrally manage them. Make sure to authenticate endpoints that are gaining access to the network, and especially using WPA2, and never an inferior encryption such as WEP. When authenticating, NAC, or Network Access Control, can be used, which uses a challenge credential to request to authenticate with a RADIUS server. Endpoint security deals with securing devices that have access on a network and can act as an endpoint. This could be a laptop, desktop, server, or even a VM. In order to protect these devices, they can have their own antivirus and updated signatures. To take things a step further, there's also EDR, which is Endpoint Detection and Response, and these agents work a lot like an IPS and IDS, and are based upon signatures, but also anomaly and behavioral feeds. They do things like block and monitor. Patch management is also very important, as unpatched machines are open to vulnerabilities. At the application layer, there are things like database monitoring and user activity monitoring. Web Application Firewalls, or WAPs, are primarily how things are controlled at the application layer. They often use the OWASP top 10 to identify the vulnerabilities and work at layer 7, or the application layer. DevSecOps is also something very important, and when there's security involved in the development process. Last, we have the data layer, 
which is the actual data we're protecting. But most importantly, we need to identify what data is actually critical. This involves classification of the data with using either tags or users manually entering the tags into the document. However, things can get confusing as users often tag differently. A lot of the data layer includes policy, and this can be found in things like data loss prevention or DLP, which can be configured to prevent data exfiltration and monitor access. Identity Access Management, or IM, also has to do with policy and deals with the approval and assigning privilege. One thing to remember about IM is that it requires periodic checking and to make sure users still have the proper access or provisioning. Encryption is another way to protect data, but not just while it's in transit over the network. This also includes data at rest or DAR encryption with either full disk or at the file level. Just as we have had data confidentiality, we also have data integrity monitoring along with the proper ways to dispose of data with regulatory things such as PCI, HIPAA, and other re legal requirements. Also how it's destroyed. Now that we've gone over each layer, I think we'd be good to talk about some final notes and approaches. A zero trust security model is important to have for an organization. And this doesn't necessarily mean that no one is trustworthy, but rather to authenticate and validate every resource while enforcing policy and really understanding what's going on meaning there needs to be high visibility in real time. There's also risk-based approaches with low risk, medium, and high probability and impact. These countermeasures are implemented in order to protect and defend against threats and vulnerabilities, but these are determined based around the risk and likelihood. SASE or Secure Access Service Edge is policy-based and can deliver wide area network security controls on a fully integrated security stack that includes CASB. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate everyone who subscribed. Please make sure to leave a like on the video and please leave any suggestions down in the comment section below. Thanks.